I think tonight is supposed to be the last night of our mysticism series. Is that, is that right? Yes? No? You don't know? Well, uh, that's what I was told. So um, let's try to bridge the bridge over transition from the mystical to the, the practical and uh, discuss some of the deeper background and some of the practical application of one of the Ten Commandments which we read last week. And that is a mysterious one, and that is Lot Tachmod, you, you shall not covet. What does that mean? What is the prohibition of coveting, of wanting something that belongs to somebody else? What does that mean? How does one transgress that? How, you ca- how can you be prohibited from not wanting something? Surely that's a response. <coughs> Many questions about this. But since this is supposed to be mysticism, maybe we just begin in the spiritual world with the idea of the tenth point. You know, the tenth of the Ten Commandments is this problem of coveting. The tenth of ten. We did begin in previous weeks to look at the ten mystical energies or the spherot or whatever you want to call them. The midot, the midas. The tenth or the last of the mystical progression is always called... It has many names, but it's called... The general term is called Malchut, that's Malchus. Malchus means, you can't really translate these things, but <coughs> in English you'd say something to do <coughs> with the rule of the king. In other words, the king's rule when applied. You remember we discussed weeks ago the concept of what's called Kesa. Kesa is the crown. That's the beginning, the first of the ten. Right, that's Tfilin, or the crown of the king. That is where the process begins. Tfilin is really, if you think about it, the crown is really not part of who I am. It sits above the head. So it's the symbol, it's the point of origin, right? Tefillin is not part of the head, although it once was. As I explained then, when Adam was created originally, Adam and Eve, Adam and Chaba, Tefillin was growing out of his head, right? We're just reconstructing that root of the human being when we wear the Tefillin. Just like a king, he wears a crown, it is not part of him, but it's very much part of him because it is the symbol, it's the beginning of where his power originates. And then it comes through the system, and the tenth point, which is called Malchus, is the product, it's the output, it's the part that in the man belongs to the woman, or it's the child that's born, or it's the totality, but it's the result, it's the output. And what I'd like to just talk about briefly is, what does that mean mystically? How, how do we understand this? And then hopefully we'll get a deeper insight into what this problem of coveting, the subtle problem of not, not wanting things that belong to other people, perhaps we'll get some deeper insight into what that means. This, this quality of Malchus is that when you have a process, you remember we said that in the unfolding of any Torah process, and there are always ten, right? You don't need to know anything about Judaism to know that there are always ten levels to its expression, ten sayings of creation, ten commandments, ten ordeals that the Jewish people faced in the desert, ten ordeals that Abraham was required to go through, culminating in having to sacrifice his firstborn, his child, ten plagues in Egypt, always the whole Torah is based on these ten emanations (coughs) grouped in five, always grouped in fives. This process of ten always in Torah is an unfolding from a root. It's not a list of things. It's always an organic unfolding. When a plant develops, the stages in the development of the plant are not simply a list of things. Each one is the result of the previous step. The first step is everything. It's a seed. (coughs) In a seed you have everything. It's not that the seed happens to be the first step and then something else happens. The seed happens. The seed has everything. The world was not created in six days. The world was created in one instant. But in six days, there was an unfolding of what was there in that seed. Of course, you realize immediately somebody who understands the Kabbalistic world will see everything from the beginning. Somebody who understands the spiritual world, if you take a seed, (coughs) you take an acorn, (coughs) you cut it in half, and you show it to an expert... That man will tell you exactly what this will look like in 25 years' time. He'll tell you what the tree will look like. He'll tell you what the leaves look like. He'll tell you everything about it. He doesn't know the future. He just knows seeds. This will unfold in that way. That's what deep wisdom consists of. 
And therefore, that's always the way it works. The first point unfolds and reveals the second. The second is always loyal to the first. Nothing can possibly be in the second step that wasn't there in the first. You didn't see it yet. And now it's unfolded and it's developed. The moment of conception, when the child is conceived, all, of, uh, all laid down. The color of his eyes and the shape of his nose, it's all there. You don't see it yet. It's only a moment of conception. That's why the moment of conception is so critical. The togetherness of the parents at the moment of conception is so critical. What's in their minds at that moment is so critical because that brings down the soul at that moment. It cannot be fixed later. That's why moments of origin are so important. But the second is loyal to the first and that's the seed of the rest. The third is an outflow from the second. And each step is always loyal to the one that came before and had you seen deeply enough you would have seen it there in the previous step. It is always an unfolding of what was there before and it always is an expression. Each step is always the root of what will come afterwards. And that process will continue. The only exception, <coughs> if you like, exception, is the last one. The last one is not a seed of anything else. The last one is only the coming to fruition. It's the result. It's the totality, the totality of what has happened. It has nothing in it besides <coughs> bringing to completion the process. Think about it for a moment. What is Shabbat? Shabbat is the end of the process. What does Shabbat have? Nothing of its own. You do nothing on Shabbat. <clears throat> Shabbos is nothing other than a revelation of what the week was. For example, every time the Torah speaks about Shabbos, it always introduces it by speaking of six days of work first. Because Shabbos is only the culmination of six days of work. You take your hands off the work, and the work is completed. Obviously, it only happens if the work was done. Shabbat, Shabbos is the seventh point <coughs> out of ten. The three higher ones are not revealed in the world. But the seven that are revealed in the world, this room has six sides. There are four walls, a roof, and a floor three-dimensional world that has six sides. The seventh is the coming together of all the six. You can't possibly have the seventh without the other six. You can have the sixth without the seventh. I can show you that wall, I can show you that wall, I can show you the ceiling, I can show you the floor, but I can't show you the seventh. But when they're all together, you see it. I can't pull it out and show it to you, but I can show you when it's there. When all the six meet each other, then you have the thing that is the seventh. The seventh is never anything other than the result of putting all the rest together. It's an amazing thing. This is an introduction to the spiritual world. When you hear music, no one can play music. You can only play notes. You can only play notes. When you play the seven notes in the scale correctly, that's all you can do. Something else happens called music. I can't pull it out and show it to you. I can't play that for you. I can only play the notes. I can only show you the six sides. When I put them together, you see the room. When I play the notes correctly, which is all I can do, you hear the music. Unless you're very insensitive. You hear, and, and not only that, the point of the exercise is the music. The point is not this plink or that plunk or that plunk or this plink. That's not music. It's when the plinks and plunks come together and they make an effect called music. That's the totality. And all of life, all meaning in life is like that. A relationship is like that. A love between two people. A love between two people is a series of actions. That's all. Trivial, pathetically small actions. It's a little smile, another word, another kind word, another... It's one deed after another and it builds a relationship after many years of doing that. Something transcends the parts. And therefore, the last of the series is always nothing other than the fullness of the series. And that's called Malchus. The beginning is the crown of the king. That's where you see, that's where the power derives from, devolves from. And finally, the last thing is exactly the application of the crown, the crown on the ground. And that is called Malchus. That's the rule of the king where his feet stand, and that's where he is manifest. And it's nothing other than all the steps that have come before. The Zohar puts it this way. It says that the, the tenth quality of Malchus is called Le Slei Migar Klum. He has nothing of his own. By the way, that's why a Jewish king is this. A Jewish king is a person who has nothing of his own. The paradox of a Jewish king. Who needs a king? Who needs a king? We need Hashem. We are only under God. If there's one thing we fixated on in Judaism, it's Hashem Olekein, Hashem Echad, and there's nothing else. Who needs a king? In Judaism, we're allergic to intermediaries. We don't need intermediaries. Who needs a king? Who needs the Messiah? Who needs the Mashiach? And not only that, the paradox of the Mashiach is he'll be the Jewish king who'll rule at a time when he's completely unnecessary. When will the Mashiach walk the earth? When Hashem manifests openly, when there's world peace and no one's, everything's fine and you see God openly, who needs a Mashiach then? If you ask me, I would say we need him now. You know, no one asked me. But if they'd asked me, I would have said, now's where we need him. But in the final phase of history, when Hashem himself takes over, who needs Mashiach? The answer is because not only will Hashem be manifesting correctly at the end of history, so will we. The Mashiach will be the representative of all mankind. He will be the most amazingly incontrovertible unilateral leader total international king, totally incontrovertible with no possibility of any opposition, and he will show that he's nothing. That's transparency. Yeah? That's not a Jewish king. He's a totally open channel. The greatest person who ever lived was the king called Moses. Moshe was the king of the Jewish people. 
He was the greatest because he was the emptiest. He was the humblest. He could make himself completely divested of ego, completely transparent. The paradox is he was so transparent that he shone with a powerful light. People couldn't bear to look at him, the light was so strong. Obviously, once you're transparent, the light can shine through. Rav Asaman used to say, the world is full of light except where we cast the shadows. Most of us are so busy trying to shine the light, we're just getting in the way. But if you could make yourself transparent, then the light would shine. <coughs> and that's Malchus. Le slay me garme klum. He has nothing of his own. Completely empty. When a process comes to an end, all you want to see is the process. You don't want to see the end. If you have a very good computer screen, uh, let's bring it down to the... If you have a good computer screen, you, you, you know about this. There's one thing the screen should never show you. There's one thing you should never see on the computer screen. What is that? That's right, the screen. And if, it's a, if you see the screen, it's a bad screen. It should show you what it's showing you. It should be transparent and invisible. A good teacher, by the way, should be invisible. A good teacher should have no personality and no charisma. He should sh- the subject should shine from him or her. A good teacher, if you're seeing the teacher, you're mistaking it. That's you're, he's, he's obstructing the subject. Somebody who can teach well. You shouldn't see the person. You should see what is teaching. <laughs> I was once in the presence of a great rabbi. And he, he, that night he had to speak to some university students, a large group of university students, and I had the honor of fetching them. So, so on the way we discussed what he, he was going to talk about the Holocaust. That was what he was going to talk about these students, a very, very emotional subject. And I happened to know that this great rabbi was many years ago, not a religious person, and he was a student leader on a major campus, university campus in a certain place, and he was very charismatic. He was, he was a dramatist, he was very charismatic, full of personality. And I thought, this is going to be an explosion. Because he's got immense Torah knowledge, and he's going to speak about one of the most emotive subjects possible. You know, he's going to have them dissolved in tears. And I went to the talk, and he spoke to them for two hours with no inflection in his voice and no emotion at all. And he taught the subject. On the way back, I said to him, I was amazed. I said to him, you had in your hands the most powerful subject. You could have reduced them to absolute liquid. <coughs> He said, I didn't want them to hear me. I wanted them to hear the subject. Because using the drama of the situation and doing all that, there was a danger that would obstruct the subject if I kept himself out of it completely. That is Malchus. Malchus means it's the transparent endpoint where it shows you only what has come before and it, does not, it doesn't interfere. All the problems in the world, all evil arrives, arises in the dimension of Malchus. That's the only place it could arise. All distortion, all ego... All breakaway from source is when instead of the screen showing you what it's showing you, it shows you itself and it pretends to be showing you the reality. And that's always the problem. It's always the point of vision. You know, it says that Moshe ben Moses, he saw through what the Kabbalists call an aspaklaria meira, a light lens, a lens that is completely clear. All other prophets saw through a lens that's not completely clear. That's called aspaklaria she'ena meira. It means many other things as well, but a simple meaning is he saw through a glass clearly. Other prophets saw through a glass darkly. They saw through a glass that had some, some tinge to it, so, some cloudiness. That's what it says. He saw clearly, they didn't see clearly. But there's something categorically different between them. Rav Desli used to say this, very beautiful. He used to say this. What's the difference between looking through a lens that is clear and a lens that is cloudy? The difference is this. When you look through a lens that is clear, you see exactly what's through the lens. There's a lens. Every human being has to see through a lens. Nobody sees without it. But if you look through a clear lens, you see what's on the other side. If you look through a cloudy lens, you see a reflection of yourself. The dirtier the lens is, the cloud, the more you... But you don't know that. Because the cloudier your lens is, the less insight you have. So you think you're seeing reality, not seeing a reflection of yourself. So the person with the most egotistical, unclarified personality sees... All he sees in the world is himself. Everybody is there to serve him. Even God. It's all there for his... And therefore, of course, the work of life is to polish that lens until there's nothing of your own. Right? And then you become paradoxically very great. Because then you're filled with the ultimate reality and not your childish, broken away version that is advertising your emptiness. So that is the that is Malchus. Malchus is the last quality and it is the place where it all comes to manifestation. It's a transparent, it's only a demonstration of what went before, a loyal unfolding of the process and being brought to its fruition. Let's take a look at the mitzvah of coveting. See, what is this, how, does it, how does it apply in the emptiness of spirit that wants nothing other than what I have? Right? That's what not coveting means in depth. It means looking at things in the world and knowing where they belong. I don't even desire for it. A person spiritually correctly constructed wouldn't even want something that belongs to somebody else. 
let alone make a strategy about how to get it. They say one of the Greek philosophers, one of the great, great early Greek philosophers, the story they tell about him is that he went for a walk in the marketplace and he came back and he told his friends he was amazed to see how many things there are in the world that he doesn't need. <laughs> you should only want what you have and you should only have what you want. Then you'll have what you want. If you only want what you have, then you'll have what you want. As soon as you want things beyond... So how does this reflect itself in halakha? You know, the halakhic aspect is always a revelation of the Kabbalistic depth. It's always like that. All halakhic application in the world, all that is in the world, all that the world yeah, is always expressed in the Musa dimension, in the Kabbalistic dimension, and it's also expressed in the halakhic dimension. If you understand the mitzvahs correctly, you'll see every nuance of a mitzvah is an expression of a spiritual idea. How is not coveting an expression of this transparency, of this taking nothing for the self? Let's look briefly at the expression of this mitzvah. First of all, you know it's the tenth of the Ten Commandments. That raises a number of questions. The first question is, why are there Ten Commandments altogether? To understand the tenth of the Ten Commandments, you have to understand why there are Ten Commandments. That's the first question. And the second question is, why is it the tenth of ten, which parallels the fifth of five? You know the Ten Commandments are not one string of ten, they are two strings of five. The first five commandments are between us, between man and God, between the human being and Hashem. The other five are between man and man, human beings, interpersonal. They're balanced against each other, and that's why they were not written on one stone, they were written on two. Those are the two tablets, just like the whole human body is duplicated, two sides to the heart. In fact, the Ten Commandments should be written on the heart. It says, Kasvem aluach libecha. Katvem aluach libecha. Carve them, write them on the tablets of your heart. By the way, that's why the Ten Commandments are always depicted with a rounded top. You know that? Any shul in the world, you've got any synagogue, synagogue in the world, Ashkenazi, Sephardi, their tablets are depicted as two stone tablets with rounded tops. They did not have rounded tops. They were completely square or even cubic, bored through and through. Clear. They were six tvachim, that's about this, about this long, six tvachim high, and square, and they had an absolutely flat top. The Jewish people have always given them rounded tops because it's a childlike depiction of a heart. Because the Ten Commandments are Kasvem al That's where they should be written, not on some piece of stone. And that's why it's an ancient tradition to depict them that way. But there are two sides to the heart. The first side is the, is the higher side. That is my relationship with Hashem. And then there's the second, which is my relationship with you. There's a third too, of course. That's my relationship with myself, which is built out of the other two. That's on what it's constructed. But these are the two sets of instructions. So the two questions we have to answer is, what, what is the nature of the Ten Commandments altogether? It's an embarrassingly simple question. And secondly, how do the two sets parallel each other? And from that we try to understand something about coveting. First of all, why are the Ten Commandments? I mean, it's a very child, a child's question, really. But it's surprisingly difficult to answer. I think if you do a survey in the world, Jewish or non-Jewish world, you ask people, what is the meaning of the Ten Commandments? People without a moment's thought, they will tell you, well, those are, those are big. Those are the biggies. If you do those, you're a moral person. You know, in many, in many American courtrooms, outside the courtroom, they have a depiction of they have Ten Commandments. There's even there wasn't a scandal about it. A couple about a year ago, there was a scandal in an Arkansas courtroom. Somebody saw the Ten Commandments and they demand they be removed because it's a confusion of religion, church, and state. Conf- confusion of church and state. It's a courtroom. It's an organ of the state. It's got nothing to do with religion. Okay. But the point is that the non-Jewish world will tell you that the Ten Commandments, not adultery and not stealing and not killing, that defines a moral person. That's a big mistake, that. First of all, what defines a moral human being is the seven mitzvahs of the Noahides, and they're not the same as the Ten Commandments. Not the same. One of the Noahide mitzvahs is not to pull a living limb off an animal and eat it while the animal's alive. There's other mitzvahs too. Having a court system of justice, not the same as the Ten Commandments. So it's not the basic set of moral of morals. And secondly, if it is the basic set of morals, why is not coveting one of the basic set of moral principles? It's more important than tefillin, than tzitzis, than, than, than Shabbos, than, well, Shabbos is there, but you know, many other mitzvahs would have been... And by the way, where it says thou shalt not steal in the Ten Commandments, it's not referring to stealing. It happens to be referring to kidnapping. It's very clear. The Torah elsewhere says you're not allowed to steal. The Om of Hashem are very clear. Not stealing in the Ten Commandments referring to kidnapping. Why is that one of the Ten Commandments? What are you... Why are these more major? And in the non-Jewish conception, there's always some truth. That means there's a distortion. These are not more important than others, but in some way they must be. What are they? And the answer is that the Ten Commandments are not more important than others. The Ten Commandments are the roots of the others. You know, people think like this. Moshe Rabbeinu came down the mountain with Ten Commandments, five and five. 
Where's the rest of the Torah? He went up to the mountain to receive the Torah and bring it down to us. So he comes down, you know, we're waiting for him to come down, and he's carrying ten. Where's the rest of the Torah? So people think, well, you know, they were happy. <laughs> so, you know, carry tens and okay, it's a sample, you know. So. The answer is he was carrying the whole Torah. The ten are the root categories. Each of those ten unfolds, unpacks into many others. You want to look this up, look it up in the Ibn Ezra. Ibn Ezra has a list of each mitzvah where it comes out of one of the Ten Commandments. He does it explicitly. He goes to each of the ten and he shows you. In this of the Ten Commandments, there are 63 mitzvahs and he lists what they are. He doesn't let you into the secret of how he knows which come out of which. There's a lot of work to be done. That's what he does. The Ten Commandments, and why is it like that? Because the Torah is always an unfolding organic process. It begins with one thing that unfolds into a set, into two, three unify them, four comes out of that, five unifies them. It is always a process of unfolding, and therefore there's only one commandment, I am Hashem. But it has an expression of two-ness, I am Hashem, and don't be disloyal to me, that's the second. And that unpacks into ten. And the ten unpack into six hundred, actually there should have been a thousand. One of the great Kabbalists, Ram Khal, says, if it's systems of ten, there should have been a thousand commandments. Why six hundred and thirteen? He says there are, there are a thousand lights in the world, but only six hundred and twenty have been revealed. Six hundred and twenty, by the way. You know that... There's 613 commandments and seven rabbinic commandments, or 613 and seven Noahide commandments. And that's called the Tarach Amudai Or. Tarach is the 620 columns of light that the world is built on. The others beyond 620, up to 1,000, are not revealed in the world. The 620 revealed elements, by the way, Tarach in Hebrew spells Keter. The 620 in Hebrew spells the crown. What could be more? And if you count the letters in the Ten Commandments, there happen to be 620 letters. Another accident. But that is the number of letters because that is the that is the root. It's an unfolding of what's in the crown, which is the point of origin. By the way, you want to know why it's 620? Tonight's supposed to be Kabbalah, so I'll let you into a secret. Without explanations, just a clue. Do you know that in Kabbalah, the transition from the dark to the light is 103? I'm sure you're all black belt Kabbalists. I'm sure you know that. 103. When you move out of the world of darkness and you transition into the world of light, that's always 103. You see it in many words. The word Egel, the golden calf, Egel is 103. They were trying to do the right thing, but they got it desperately wrong. That's the borderline. The word Emunah in Hebrew, which means faith, is 102. Emunah is still in the darkness. You haven't yet seen the light, but you're moving towards it. It's 102. When Yaakov and Esau battled, Jacob and Esau strove with each other. It says, Vayavek ish imoy. They rose dust. The two of them battled till dawn. And in the friction between them, they rose dust up to the spiritual world. Dust in Hebrew, Avak, is 103. Right? In other words, always the battle between good and evil, that transition. Look into Hillel. When you get to number 103, the first time it says, Hallelujah. Now you can say, Hallo, you can praise Hashem, because that's become apparent. It's always like that. 103 is always... There's a lot to say about it, but that... Now, in Kabbalah, when you want to see the balanced thing, Zelu Matzeh, you always have the two things balanced. First, the essence is established, and then it unfolds into its opposite part. For example, the first verse in the Torah has seven words. Reish is Bara Elohim, Es Hashemayim, Es Aretz. The second has 14, of course. Ba'aretz Haisa Toyu Vavoyi Vacheshech Al Pnei Toyim, Ruach Elohim, Rachepes Al Pnei Amai. 14. Always like that. By the way, the Ten Commandments, the first verse in the Ten Commandments, also has seven words. Obviously. Two beginnings to the Torah. But be that as it may, so you always have this unfolding into the good and bad, or the dark and light equivalents. When you put 203s together, you get 206. Everybody knows that 206 is light. 206 in Hebrew, 207 is or. When you put 206 elements together, so then the 207th, the music, as we said, is heard, always. That's called the kola. When you put gematrias, you take details, you put them together. When the details manifest together, you always add one. In other words, the thing expresses itself as a totality. So 207 is always, in Hebrew, 207 is or. That's when the light shines. Actually, Raz in Hebrew, Raz means the secret world. That's also 207. And of course, from here it's easy. Add another 103, you get 310. Right? You get 310. 310 is yesh. That's the firm, you have the two polarities and the unifying element that joins them. Like it says in the future, every righteous person will be given 310 worlds. That's called yesh. Shai, the same letters in Hebrew, means an ultimate gift. That is the 310 worlds. And anybody can see that when you fulfill that and you duplicate that, you get 620. So that is where you get the 620 elements, an expression of all fractals, if you like, of the light and dark meeting. And that's the borderline. That from 620 to 1000, those are not revealed in the world. If you want to look this up, the Ramchal says this in 
Kinas Hashem Swakri, it's a wonderful bu- book that he talks about this in Kabbalistic language. So, that is the unfolding, and the Torah always works that way, that the first is always, you know, the first word, you know, Torah is two beginnings. Torah begins with the word Anochi, that's the Ten Commandments beginning, and it begins with the word Bereshis in the beginning, two forms of beginning. The word Bereshis in the beginning contains the whole Torah, obviously it's the first word. Bereshit, for example, take the six letters of the word Bereshis and rearrange them in any permutation you like, Right? How many permutations are there of six letters? 720, that's what you're about to say, right? 720. All the 700, they all spell the beginning. For example, Bereshi spells Borosh Shes, he created six. Or it spells Yerei Shabbos, Yerei Shabbat, moving towards Shabbat. Or it spells Brit Esh, a covenant of fire, which is what the Torah is. Or it spells Yashar, Aleph Beis Taf, straight from Aleph Bet to the Taf. Whichever way you rearrange them. Those letters, because it's the first word, it must contain the whole Torah. The God of Vilna once said that the first word of the Torah, Bereshis, contains all the mitzvahs of the Torah. Every mitzvah. So once he was sitting at a pidjon aben, right, redemption of the firstborn son after 30 days. So one of the students turned and they said, Rebbe, you told us that every mitzvah is in the, in the first word of the Torah. Where does the word Bereshit say pidjon aben? He said, what's the problem? Ben, Rishon, Achash, Loshim, Yom, Tifteh. That's what the word says. The six letters on anagram of you shall redeem the firstborn son after 30 days. What's the problem? That's what the word says. Right? And he could do that with every mitzvah. If it's the first, if it's the moment of conception, it has all the genes. Similarly, the, the Gemara says all the Torah is contained in the Ten Commandments. And all of the ten are contained in the first one. And all of the first ones contained in the word Anochi, I am. And all of that's contained in the Aleph. Because what's an Aleph? As we've said many times, an Aleph is two tens, two yuds and a vav. The ten mystical dimensions coming down from the high world, ten as they're reflected in this world, joined by the letter that joins spiritual worlds. Vav in Hebrew means and. Vav means a hook. So it's 26, Hashem's name, the divine name, two tens and a vav, etc., etc. So it always is an unpacking, and therefore the ten commandments are not more important than the others. They are the root categories. That's why they, if they're more important, this is why they're more important. They're the ten packaged Totalities out of each of these ten <coughs> unfolds all the rest of the 630. Therefore, co- not coveting is not more weighty morally than other mitzvahs, but it's a category that contains all that the tenth point contains. And that is emptiness and not wanting anything that doesn't belong to me is a complete emptiness of desire. That should be clear. Let's talk a little bit about the practicalities. How do you fulfill this mitzvah or how do you transgress it? I think a way to understand this is How they parallel each other. You know, the Ten Commandments, the five and five parallel. How does that work? The first of the man-God commandments parallels the first of the man-man commandments and so forth. It's obvious. The first of them is, I am Hashem. Right? That's a relationship between me and Hashem. I understand that He is in the world. He's the spirit of the world. He animates the world. He's the life of the world. How does it correspond to? Don't kill. What is a human being? human being is a biological organism with a spark of the divine in him. Manifesting Hashem in the world, that's emunah. Manifesting this human soul in the human being is killing, is the, you see, this is the positive side, root of positives, this is the negative. How you transgress, what the sin of killing is, is banishing from a human, you're banishing from the world a spark of Kedusha. What's wrong with killing someone? What's wrong with killing someone? You've exiled from the world, you've separated that person, you've taken away his place in the world. When you kill somebody, you've taken a soul that lives in the world because it has a body to live in, and you've sundered them, you've snapped them apart. That's exactly like banishing Hashem from the world. Yes? In, 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 in those two parallels. Emunah means Hashem, you're in the world, I see you. I manifest you in the world. Right? The opposite of that is when you push Hashem out of the world. You kill somebody, you push him out, you push him. You know when someone dies, we say Kaddish. What is Kaddish? Kaddish is putting sanctity back into the world. Kedusha. Kaddish doesn't mention the dead. Kaddish is a statement of Kedusha. Why? Because somebody's left the world, the world is that much poorer. There's that less Kedusha in the world. So we say Kaddish, we bring it back into the world. By the way, it's amazing. What is the punishment for killing? What have you done when you've killed somebody? You've banished them. You've sent them away to another place. You've deprived them of their place in the world. The punishment for killing in Torah is always banishing of the soul that killed. Example. When Adam brings death to the world, what happens? Banished from the garden. He brought death to the world. Death means you're taking the soul and exiling it from its place of residence. He gets exiled from the garden. Cain kills Abel. Cain kills Hevel. What's his punishment? You become a wanderer. You have no place to live. You have to lose your place in the world. What's the Torah punishment for killing somebody accidentally? Exile. You lose your place. You have to go 
You lose your place to be in the world. The city of refuge. That's the only place you can live. You see it time and again. Why are the Jewish people in exile? Because every sin is the killing of something in the world. It's a killing of Kedusha in the world. Therefore, we lose our place. Israel is the place of doing mitzvahs. Israel is the only place where you can really fulfill mitzvahs completely. Therefore, you kill that, you leave. You lose your place. You see it in many, many expressions. And that is much more to say about that, but that is the... What's the second? The second of the commandments is you should have no other gods before me. That's the ultimate marital infidelity. The ultimate marital relationship is you married to Hashem. Worshipping another god is total betrayal of that relationship. Do not commit adultery. Those two are exactly parallel. The only time the Torah uses the word jealousy, when God describes him as jealous, is idol worship. Because that's a false marital relationship. That's intimacy in the wrong place. And therefore, the parallel between not worshipping... By the way, it's amazing. It's a bit too vulgar to go into in public. Is it? The Torah uses the same words for idolatry as it does for marital impurity, for marital relationships of impurity. It uses the same words of znut, of... You know, because it's the same thing exactly. I want to say the details. Think about what Rochel did when she took the trophim from Lovon. What did she do with it? And what did she say about them? Look, look it up. It's very obvious. As a woman. But be that as it is. And therefore, the second of the commandments is, you shall have no other gods before me. Don't be disloyal to this intimate relationship. Don't commit adultery. What's the third parallel? The third is, not using Hashem's name in vain. <coughs> Don't take to yourself. Don't use that name inappropriately. On the other side, don't steal. Don't take a soul inappropriately. Don't take something that doesn't belong to you. Right? Those are the two parallels. The fourth of the commandments, Shabbat. What is Shabbos? Testimony that Hashem created the world. On Shabbos, you declare, Hashem, you the master. You created the world. You take your hands off. It's not me, it's you. Don't bear false witness against a human being. Exactly the two parallels. Testimony that Hashem created the world is on the positive, on this side, and the man-man relationship is, don't bear false witness against a human being, betrayal of testimony in the world. And here comes the interesting exercise for tonight. The fifth of the mitzvahs is honoring parents. How's that parallel to coveting? The parallel is clear, right? I mean, I hope I convince you of that. No? Yes? Anyone? So how is the fifth one parallel? Not honoring parents, right? Kibbut and First of all, the first question to ask about that before we discuss coveting is why is honoring parents on the man God side? Human p- parents are human. I mean, not that every child would always be ready to necessarily admit that, but you know, parents are sort of more or less human. So when you honor your parents, you're dealing with a human relationship. They're special humans, but they <coughs> they're human. But the Torah includes them on the man God side. And the fifth of the man God mitzvahs is honoring your parents. Why? The meaning is this. The fifth of the man-God mitzvahs is the transition zone between how I relate to Hashem and how I relate to human beings. After all, the five and five stack like this, but they also stack like that. These are the first five and these are the second five. So the fifth of how I relate to Hashem is now not relating to Him directly, but relating to Him through my parents. After all, who are my parents? My point of origin. So I look back to my parents as a point of origin. If I have any intelligence, I will realize they have a point of origin. I look back to my grandparents. If I have any process of thought, it will take me back to the first humans. And any honest person is going to go back from there to Hashem. And therefore, honoring your parents is the beginning of a process that takes you retroactively. Honoring parents is one of the Ten Commandments because a person who honors his parents correctly and understands what he's doing will discover God. Therefore, God consciousness will come into the world in a person who goes and knows how to attribute origins correctly. Why is honoring parents so important? You know, the Talmud brings all its examples of honoring parents from non-Jews. From non-Jews. Why? Because you don't need to be Jewish for this. Understanding that you're only in the world. If there's anything you owe anybody, it's your existence, and that's your parents. You know, in Hebrew, thanking is the same word as admitting. Modem means I thank, it means I admit. Because when I thank you, I'm admitting that it wasn't me, I needed you for this. (coughs) Honoring parents means you're going back, there's an appreciation and a gratitude, but it's an admission of where you come from. And therefore, it's on the one hand relating to people, but on the other hand, it's the beginning of a process that will take you all the way back to a point of ultimate origin. And therefore, it's appropriately attributing sources. And that's what not coveting is. When you look across the neighbor, the, the, the fence and you see your neighbor's stuff and you attribute it appropriately, it's his. Instead of wanting to take it to yourself, in, again, a person who doesn't appreciate his parents is a person who says, I don't need them, they're irrelevant, I'm my own explanation. I'm my own source. I'm all that counts. Such a person will look across the fence and think, that stuff belongs to me. 
It happens to be his wife, his donkey, his... Not necessarily in that order of <laughs> desirability. But... And therefore, a person who honors parents correctly knows how to attribute source correctly, and he doesn't appropriate or arrogate to himself something that isn't his. Such a person will approach the world that way. And therefore, the parallel on the man-God side is, I know where I come from, I couldn't have done it without them, I owe my existence to them. And the man-man side is, that stuff belongs to him, he was given it because he needs it, I wouldn't want it. That's how they, the two parallel. The, um, Ibn Ezra says, you know, there's a famous argument between our early authorities. Ben Ezra says that the prohibition of not coveting means not wanting, that's all. You happen to look across the fence and see his house, or his wife, or whatever it is, the moment you crave it, you've transgressed. Just wanting it. And all the commentaries say, Ibn Ezra himself says, how can God command you not to want? And he answers this, if you understood correctly that you were given what you need in the world, and that person's being given what he needs in the world, it wouldn't occur to you to want it. What on earth could you do? with the thing that you don't need. The way he puts it is like this, even more extreme. He says that a person never craves something that doesn't occur to them that might have some relationship with them. Nobody longs to jump to the moon. It's just irrelevant. Something that's utterly impossible, out of your frame of reference, you couldn't want. If you want something belonging to somebody else, it means you've got a beginning of a thought that maybe you could get it somehow. He's in a famous analogy. He says a peasant farmer tilling the land doesn't crave marrying the princess. It's irrelevant. It's completely impossible. And therefore, you don't awaken a craving for something that's completely beyond the realm of your capacity to even imagine. If you were correctly disposed as a human being, you couldn't imagine taking something from somebody else, and therefore you wouldn't even want it. That's his opinion. Fortunately for most of us, there's another opinion, and that is that you don't transgress until you start strategizing about how to get it. Again, no one says it's good to want other people's things. It just may not be directly transgressing as one of the Ten Commandments. According to this opinion, the way you transgress it is when you put pressure on somebody to give you something and you get them to give it to you or sell it to you, when they give it willingly, legally, but emotionally unwillingly. That's when you transgress. By the way, many Rishonim say you transgress coveting when you steal too. Because you covet it as well. When you walk into somebody's house, right, at night with a black mask and a crowbar like... No, I don't know you personally, but I presume most nights that's not what you that's not what you're doing. And then you walk out with some goods. So I reshown him say you have transgressed stealing and coveting. Because the coveting was the was the thing that led you to the it transgressed that as well. But the, the most pervasive opinion is this that when you covet something, you transgress it by strategizing. The moment the trans transgression begins is when you start coming up with a strategy about how to get it, and the moment you you clinch it and you transgress you, you finalize the transgression is the moment the person gives it to you. So I come to your house and I say to you, oh, I, I like this object, you know, maybe you'll give it to me. And the person says no. And you say, maybe you'll sell it to me. A and he says no. And you start putting pressure on this person, emotional duress in front of his guests, and eventually he feels so embarrassed and pressurized that he gives it to you or even sells it to you. 100% transgression of coveting. You cannot be accused of stealing, he gave it to you. There's a full legal contract. Whether he sold it or gave it, but because he would rather not have done, you transgress coveting. By the way, the final test is, is it, is it fully willing? For example, let's say you negotiate with someone. The person has a price. He wants a certain price for his object, and you negotiate. And you bring him down in price significantly below the price that he wanted to settle for. And he settles. No coveting. Why? Because he settled willingly. He needed the money. <coughs> is this clear? The fact that he had a personal pressure financially, that's not the problem. Is this clear? The test is this. Would he have gotten out of it if you'd let him? Uh, am I being clear? You're dealing with somebody who's hard-pressed financially, and he needs money, and he's got an object that's worth 10,000 pounds. Okay? But you know he's under pressure. So although it's worth 10, and you know it's worth 10, you offer him 6. And eventually there's no option when he takes it. There's no coveting at all there. I'm not saying that's a nice thing to do. Reason is, if you said, look, I'll let you back out, you don't have to do it, he'd say, no, 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 I'll take it. Is this clear? <coughs> The problem is when the person would back out if you let him and you force him not to. This needs to be clear. Yeah? Am I making myself clear? And therefore, when the pressure, the emotional pressure is on, by the way, there's a related problem with gambling. Do you know that? There's a related problem with gambling. When you sit down to play poker, at the end of the night, you win. The other fellow hands over his money. It's emotionally unwilling. He didn't sit down to lose. Is that clear? When someone parts with money to get something in exchange, he's getting goods. But a gambling loss, 
he does not at all want to pay. He has to because that's the rules of the game. It's not a legal problem, but that's called a smart that's problematic. Of course, if you want to play poker, you can get around this by putting in your money beforehand. If you all put your money into the pool, that's completely willing. It's for the right to play. Now it's divested from his ownership. When you pick up the pool at the end of the evening, it's no problem. There's another problem, the Gemara says, and that's a professional gambler falls foul of another problem. It's not tonight's nice subject. A professional gambler transgresses another problem, and that is that a professional gambler is unique in all human activities. You know what the uniqueness is? A professional gambler earns a living, but he supplies nothing to society. All other things that you earn a living, you earn a living and society gets something from you. You sell goods, you provide a service, and therefore you're locked into societal interrelationships. But a person who's a professional gambler is not trusted to be a witness in Jewish law. The reason is he has no bond into societal connections. He earns, but he doesn't supply. By the way, you can also get around that if, you're, if you need to. And that is if you're not a professional gambler. Is that clear? If you do something useful during the day, right? you do something that you get, and at night you happen to gamble, and you put your money in beforehand. So then you're only guilty of Bittul Torah and about 400 other transgressions, but you're not guilty of, you're not guilty of so when you pressurize someone emotionally and they finally give you the object then you have transgressed because although they gave it to you legally and they're not falling foul you're not falling foul of stealing but since there was emotional pressure and it results in an action namely they've given the thing to you that is when you transgress let me finish with an example that I think makes this clear and We'll stop there. Maybe you have questions. I'm happy to try to answer if I can. Oh, by the way, let me point this out. Leis Sachmun means when you want your neighbor's object, not when you want one like his. Is that clear? You look across the fence, you see his wife is very attractive. It makes you motivated to go get married. That's fine. There's no problem when seeing somebody's object makes you want one like that. The problem is when you want his. That's the problem. Uh, even less mature is when you want him not to have it. It doesn't matter if you have it as long as he doesn't. Okay, that, that's even less mature. But the problem is when you want his. If you see your neighbor has something that stimulates a desire in you, you want to go get one. That's it may be very immature of you to have cooked up a desire only because you saw somebody else had it. That's not good, but it's not... Is this clear? Jealousy, this type of covetousness is only for his object. It's not for one like his. That's not an issue. Um... Let me share with you a, a, an illustration that I think perhaps will round it off. Once, I, I had the privilege of studying for a long time with Rabbi Zilberstein, his Rabbi son-in-law, one of the great halachic. He's an authority of this generation. I had the privilege of studying with him because every month he gives a, a, an amazing shear to doctors in Bnei Brak about medical halachic matters. And once he was approached with the following medical question, an amazing question. There was a family in Israel that had a little boy dying of kidney failure. The child had a transplant of a kidney from a sibling, but it was rejected. He then had a transplant from his mother, it was rejected again. They then did a third transplant, which was rejected again. And because there was no hope for this child, the surgeons wanted to try a fourth transplant. It's like an unheard of medical thing, but there was no other hope. There was an 18-year-old sister that they wanted to take the kidney from. The parents came to Azilstein to ask him the following agonizing question. They said, Rabbi... Are we allowed to pressurize our daughter to give her kidney to her brother? Or would we be transgressing the 10th of the Ten Commandments? You have a question? If we say to our daughter, how can you let him die? And we pressurize her emotionally to give the kidney, would we be transgressing the emotional pressure? She'll agree technically, but she may emotionally be unwilling. Isn't that transgressing Lois Ahmed? You have the question? By the way, this is a very real problem in kidney transplantation in general. This is not our subject tonight, but I'll just mention it. One of the major problems in transplant surgery with living donors is exactly this. What happens is this. In the non-Jewish world, you have a, a family. Somebody needs a kidney transplant. You test all the members of the family, and you find who matches antigenically. You then go to the person and they say, we'd like you to give your kidney to your brother. Would you like to? How does the person find it in their heart to say no with the coercive psychological pressure of the family looking at them and say, how can you let him die? How do people make free, free decisions? You know that halakhically, we actually agree with it. Halakhically, the ruling we follow today is that giving a kidney is so extremely safe that it's fully allowed halakhically, but it's so dangerous that you don't have to. Giving a kidney is very safe. By the way, you know the figures show that kidney donors are healthier than people who don't give kidneys. You know that? They live longer, they're healthier across the board. You know why? 
because they very carefully screen beforehand. The pool of people who give kidneys starts off healthier than others, less blood pressure problems and so forth and so on. So people who give kidneys do extremely well. The problem is there's a small risk. The risk is big enough halakhically that you're not required to do it, but it's small enough that you may. What does that mean? You have to make the choice. How do you make the choice with your family looking at you and saying, how can you refuse? Okay, this problem was solved many years ago by a certain American rabbi, interestingly, whose suggestion was adopted throughout the world. And in all kidney transplant programs throughout the world, this is what they do. They test all members of the family, and then they interview each member privately. And the surgical team sits with each member of the family. When they interview the member of the family who matches, they say to them, look, you're alone with us in this room. No one else is present. Our duty is to tell you that your kidney matches your little brother's kidney. If you agree, we'll take your kidney. If you refuse, we'll not disclose to your family that you matched. If necessary, we'll falsify the record. They will never know. You will have to live with this decision for the rest of your life. But we'll take off from you the coercive extraneous... Isn't that amazing? That's what's done. That's what, sometimes you can't do this. Sometimes there's only one family member or there's, there's extraneous... There's a very popular process going on now in mainly in America, where they do what's called cross-transplants. You know about this? It's an amazing thing. This is not coveting, okay, but it's too, it's too amazing for me not to share with you. Do you know what they do? Let's say they have a child who needs a kidney, and his mother's willing to give a kidney, but she doesn't match. So they find another mother-child couple who are also willing to give, who also don't match, but match each other. Here's Mrs. A and little A, but she doesn't match. Here's Mrs. B and little B, but she doesn't match. But Mrs. B matches little A, and Mrs. A matches little B. So they get the mothers to agree that each will give her kidney to the other child if she agrees to give her kidney to hers. And they start the operation at the same instant. So neither one can back out. That means they're two different cities. They time it exactly. They start the first cut. They anesthetize both patients' donors at exactly the same time. So no one can chicken out after the other one's given the kidney. They extract both kidneys. They fly them to each other's cities. Recently they did 10. Do you know what that means? 10. It was Mrs. A. Little... A, Mrs. B, little B, Mrs. C, little C, Mrs. D, little D, and Mrs. A matched little B, and Mrs. B matched little C, and Mrs. C matched little D. And they got them all to agree. And they started 10 operations at the same time with one extraneous volunteer. And they took out 10 kidneys, and each one got the next kidney in line within hours of each other, and 10 people were saved. No one got a kidney from their relative, but they all got matching kidneys. So when you're dealing with that sort of situation, you can't exactly keep it secret, and that, that's what's going on now. But anyway, be that as it may, there's a coercive extraneous pressure. How do you deal with that? It's a real issue. So in this case, they went to the rabbi and they said to him, can we tell our daughter that, you know, we want you to give a kidney, and you must do it, and it's immoral if you don't, and so on and so on, or are we transgressing this one and second one? As it happens, before I tell you what he, what he told them, it so happens that I happen to know that this rabbi, was once in a situation involving the same mitzvah. What happened was this. We're standing in a shop in Israel that sells expensive silver. When a very senior Israeli army officer walked in with his wife, very senior in uniform, completely secular individual, right? Completely chiloni, you know, totally secular, which often in Israel, unfortunately, means not so positively disposed towards the ultra-Orthodox world. And this officer and his wife they walked over and they chose an expensive piece of silver, $2,000 or shekels, whatever it was. And in true Middle Eastern fashion, the soldier said to the shopkeeper, he said to him, I'll give you 1500 <laughs> And the man said, fine. And they did the deal and the couple walked out. As they arrived at the door, the rabbi stood in his way. This is a classic Israeli confrontation. This is a very secular senior soldier confronted by a very rabbinic looking gentleman. He's got long silver pears. He's got a long black frock. I mean, he looks, you know... And he said to the soldier in Hebrew, you just transgressed one of the Ten Commandments. So the soldier said, what are you talking about? He said, do you know why he gave you such a discount? Such a big discount? Because he was overawed by your rank. You know, in Israel, very senior army officers often end up in politics. You'll be the minister of tax or finance. He didn't want to start anything with anybody who's going to end up in any official position. He gave you an unduly large discount, and that's called pulling rank. And that's coercive pressure. What a claim! The soldier stood and thought about it. He said to his wife, please wait here. He went back to the counter and he said to the man, I want to give you another 500. The man said to him, no, I already wrote out a receipt. Forget about it, you're going to. He took out his checkbook and he wrote another 500. And I'm not sure which of those two men to admire more. <laughs> Rabbi Zilberstein for picking out his character or this secular Jew wanted to be clean. He didn't want anything for nothing. Isn't that amazing, the Jewish people? 
Anyway, this rabbi was asked by the family, and he said, you know what? You ask your daughter to give a kidney to your to a brother, there's no problem of coveting. There may be other issues. Coveting is when I want your object for me. But when I want you to save somebody's life, where's the coveting? There's no Lois in that. The parents told their daughter, they said, if you give your kidney to your brother, we'll give you our apartment. <laughs> you know why? There was a concern that an 18-year-old girl with only one kidney might be a little less marriageable than normal. But if she comes with a nice big apartment attached, that will offset the problem. <laughs> and so the parents said, we'll find some other place to live. You give your kidney, you get our apartment. For homework, you might want to think about a separate problem, which is, uh, no time to go into it now. But a separate problem is, there is a halakhic ruling. There are authorities who say that, are you allowed to pay for an organ? Can you give compensation? Can you pay somebody for an organ? Can I buy your kidney? So the bottom line on that seems to be something like this. Again, it's not a lot of detail here. There's no hardcore prohibition of buying an organ. Paying somebody for a kidney. But our rabbis say, but if a person you're buying from is under 20, you're not allowed to do it. The Gemara says that children, young people, their hearts are close to money. I mean, some of us never outgrow that. But And until 20, people aren't considered mature in this area. In other words, so the ruling we follow is this. If a girl is 12 years old or a boy is 13, they can willingly give it. Under that age, you can't take a kidney. Even if they agree, you can't do that. If a child is under age, you cannot take their kidney. Even if they agree, because they're legally a minor, and you can't do that to them. There have been famous cases about that. There was a case in America in a non-Jewish family of an 11-year-old girl who matched her 4-year-old brother and they wanted to take a kidney. And the law precluded it because she's a minor. Non-Jewish family. They went to court. The court ruled they could not take the kidney. The girl agreed. They said she's too young to give consent. She can't give a kidney. It was heard in the Supreme Court on appeal and overturned. The surgical team brought expert psychiatric testimony to testify that if she didn't give a kidney, the psychological trauma she would face when she was older, knowing that her brother died because she didn't give a kidney, is more risk to her life than giving the kidney. I wouldn't stack up Jewishly, but that's what they did. No, I don't think so. No, not to mind. There was another case in the Jewish world of a mentally abnormal man, completely beyond, not, not functioning, who was in danger of his life from moment to moment, who was lovingly cared for by a young fellow. He prevented bed sores, he turned him, he was an amazing, amazing caregiver. You can guess what happened. The young fellow went into kidney failure, and the only person he matched was the mentally incompetent older man. But he couldn't sign consent, he was mentally incompetent. You can't take a kidney from somebody without consent. So they took it to court. You know what they argued? They said, the reason we're allowed to take this incompetent individual's kidney to give to somebody else is because his life depends on it. Because if we don't save the person who takes care of him, he's going to die. So we're taking his kidney to give it to him to save him. Does that stack up Jewish? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But these are some of the scenarios you get. So, so if a child is 12 years old, a girl, or 13 and a boy, and mature, they're allowed to give a kidney. But not if you pay them. For that, they need to be 20. Because a 15-year-old, you offer him 20,000 pounds, it's a lot of chewing gum. Or... <laughs> cocaine or whatever they enter these days. <laughs> whatever they buy when they're 14 these days. And therefore, how are the parents allowed to say to the girl, we'll give our apartment to you, because she was only 18. Anyway, we'll stop there. Thank you very much.